Hello and welcome back. Now that you understand the basics of R, you are ready, believe it or not, to get started with real data analysis. We're going to jump in headfirst in this lesson, so let's get started. What are we going to cover in this lesson? Well, here's the list of learning objectives. If you want, you can pause the video and look through, but we're going to come back to these at the end of the lesson. For now, I'm going to make some quick points. I also made these points in the last lesson, but they apply to this lesson. This is going to be another of those unusually long lessons. So I want you to feel free to watch this in sections. Usually we like short lessons, but I think at the beginning of your programming career, it's sometimes nice to have these big nuggets so you can capture a lot of information at the same time. But again, feel free to watch this in sections, take a break, and come back when you feel refreshed. Secondly, I want you to make sure you're typing along with me. This is going to be a follow-along tutorial. Next, I want you to make sure you're pausing often to think about the code and really play with it. And finally, I want you to consider this a resource that you can come back to and watch again, because it will be hard to get it all in the first try. So as usual, the first thing to do is, of course, open RStudio. If you are working with RStudio Cloud, you can, of course, go to rstudio.cloud, and it should bring you to your workspace here. If you haven't yet created a project, you can create one using that button over there for a new project. If you already have your project, you can just click on it to open it. If you are working locally on your computer, then you, of course, should go to the Applications folder and open RStudio from there. But here I'm working on the cloud. So I've opened up my project. I can see that it has loaded some of the stuff that I had from before. I don't want that. So I'm going to go ahead and restart the session. I'm going to click on Session here and then Restart R. And that should clear my environment. Okay, if it doesn't clear your environment, it means you forgot to make one of the uh, changes we had suggested before, which is going to Tools and then Global Options. And then unchecking this option for Restore.R Data into Workspace. You want to uncheck that. And you also want to set this to never. That way, whenever you restart R, you have a clear environment. So make sure you did that, OK? So now I've cleared my environment. And I can also close some of these uh, open tabs so that it's a bit uh, easier to work, OK? These are from the previous lesson. I don't need to save that, OK? And now I'm going to open up a new script. So let's go ahead and click File, New File, R Script. OK, of course, you could also use this option here or you could use the, uh, the shortcut. All right, and then let's also make this tab a bit bigger, or this pane, so that we can really see what we're doing. And now we can save this script. We're going to save it with the name uh, Ebola Analysis, because we're going to be analyzing some Ebola data. Okay, so Ebola Analysis there. Of course, if you're working locally, it's going to ask you where to put that file. You can put it anywhere you want for now. Put it somewhere that's easy to find, though. In a future lesson, we're going to talk about intelligent ways to store your R scripts. But for now, just put it anywhere on your computer. Now, unlike in past lessons, we're going to add a little header section to the start of this script. This is something you're supposed to do generally for good data analysis practice. But in the past, we haven't done it. Now we're going to do it. So I'm going to copy this piece of code here. Okay? It says Ebola Sierra Loan Analysis. So you should write that as a title. Then you should write your name. I've written here John Sample Name Doe. I'm going to change that to Ken uh, David Nuosu. And you should also write uh, the date. I'm going to write the date here as 2022. I think it is 0901 today. Okay. What is the usefulness of this? Mostly it is so other people know what your code is about by virtue of the title. They know who wrote it, so they know who they can ask questions to. And you know when it started. They know when it started as well. So it's helpful for general housekeeping, because remember that usually you're not going to be the only person working with these scripts. You're usually going to be collaborating with others. Then next, we're going to have a section called uh, Load Packages. So we're going to load all the packages that we're going to use in this analysis. So Load Packages, and then four dashes like that. Okay. Then we're going to type that code that I told you about, which helps you install and load packages. But like I mentioned, you don't need to know exactly what this code means. Just type it with me. So I go if exclamation point require, um, the package pacman, okay, then install dot packages, and then in quotes pacman. Okay, and we can run that line of code, but I know that it's already installed, so it's not going to install it afresh for me. 
Remember what this does is it checks whether this package is installed and if it's not installed, it installs it. And why are we installing this package? Because this package is a package manager, pacman, and it helps us manage other packages. So now that we have that installed, we can type the following pacman, okay, and then two colons, and then the function pload, and then inside of here we can put all the packages we're going to use in this session. The first package we're going to use is called tidyverse, and tidyverse is actually a suite of packages. It is what we call a meta package, okay, so that's a comment I'm putting there. It's a meta package, which means it loads several other packages inside of it. I will mention those packages when they come along. So I put a comma there after the code, and then I'm going to load the other packages we're going to use. Let me look at my notes and see what those are. Okay, so we're going to use this package called inspectdf, okay, put a comma there. Then we're going to use a package called plotly for some plots. Next, we're going to use a package called janitor, okay, then another one called vizdat, and then finally a package called esquisse. Very interesting package names from these uh, R package developers. So once that's typed up, I can press enter, and I'm going to see those packages being installed in my console. It might take a while for you. Sorry if your internet is slow. Okay, so now we're going to look at the data set you're going to be working with. So to do that, I've stored it on uh, Google Drive for you. So open a new tab in your browser, and let me zoom in a bit. We're going to go to the following uh, link, bit.ly slash Ebola hyphen, sorry, no, slash view hyphen Ebola hyphen data, okay? And when you go there, it should take you to this uh, CSV. Now you're going to download it by clicking on the download button there at the top right. So download that to your computer. And then now that it's downloaded to your computer, you can import it into R. However, if you are working on RStudio Cloud, then you technically don't have it on your computer yet because this is a computer on the cloud. So now we have to put it on that computer on the cloud. To do that, you're going to come here to the Files pane, okay, and click on Upload. And that way, we're going to put that data set we just downloaded to the computer on the cloud. But again, if you are on a local computer, you don't care about this step. So I go ahead, I click Choose File, and I locate that file I just downloaded. Once I've located the file, I click on OK, and we can see that the uh, data set now shows up in, uh, in my files pane. So now we're ready to import that data set into R proper. To do that, we're going to go to File, and then uh, Import Data Set, and then from, whoops, from text, but the Read R option. You could use the Base option, but it's not quite as good. So let's use the Read R option. So we click on From Text Read R, okay? And then we're going to locate where that file is. In this case, I'm on RStudio uh, Cloud, so it should just be directly in my environment there. So I can browse and I click on Ebola, Sierra Leone, CSV. If you are on a uh, local computer, it might take a little while to find that data set. You might have to navigate to it. Now this data set is very clean, so we don't need to mess with any of, this other, uh, any of these other options. We can go directly and click on Import, okay? And what it has done is a few things. If you look at your, uh, your console, let's look at the console first, we can see the code that was run by R, or by R Studio. First, it ran library read R to load the package uh, read R, and read R was then used to import this uh, CSV with the function read CSV. We didn't actually need library read R because we've actually already loaded the read R library how did we load it? When we loaded tidyverse, readr is one of the packages in tidyverse. Actually, I will mention to you all the packages in tidyverse later on, but let's go back to the console for now. Okay, so it loaded readr and then got us the read CSV function and then imported that dataset Ebola Sierra Leone. It printed some outputs about what it was doing when it imported the dataset. We don't have to consider that for now. And the last thing it did is it ran this function here view Ebola Sierra Leone so that you could look at it in your data viewer, okay? We can see what that data set looks like here again, but we're not quite done with the data importing process. There's still one more thing we should do. What we should do is we should take the code that was just run, specifically this line here, Ebola Sierra Leone read CSV blah blah blah, and we should put that in our actual script. So let's put that in our script and let's title that section something like a load data. So why is it important to copy that code and put it in your script? Because your script needs to be a reproducible record of the analysis that you have done. This is the concept of a reproducibility. 
the whole point and click stuff that we had done, it's hard to tell someone else's computer to do that. But when you put this code in your script, then you can send this to anyone and they will be able to automatically rerun your analysis and reproduce all of your results. So although it is nice to use that graphic user interface point and click functionality to import your data set, you should always copy the relevant code and put it in your script so that your script can run from A to Z as a reproducible record of what you have done. Now a small side note, and this is especially relevant if you're working on a local computer. If you're working on a local computer, it is likely that the path for your file is not just Ebola Sierra Leone uh, CSV, but rather something like uh, users slash kene slash desktop or slash downloads slash blah 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 blah, the exact location of this file in your computer. Now that is not fully reproducible because that would not, would not apply if you send the code to someone else. So later on, I'll introduce you to the concept of RStudio projects, which give you a nice way to have reproducible data paths that don't have all of this uh, personal stuff, users, can blah, blah, blah. So now that we know that our script is a reproducible record of everything we have done, then we can do something crazy like restarting R and rerunning everything we just did. So we're practicing this concept of reproducibility by going to session, restarting R, to clear our workspace and clear our console. And because this thing is fully reproducible, we can just rerun it. Press Command A when your cursor is anywhere in the uh, script, and then press Command Enter or Control Enter and send that code uh, to your console. What that is going, going to do is uh, load all of these packages again and then import your data set. So it's easy to redo the analyses. It's easy to reproduce the analyses. Of course, we haven't quite done any analyses yet, but this concept will flow through to all of your analytic workflow. Now, most of this lesson is going to focus on a single data set, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what that data set is. This is from the 2014 to 2016 West African uh, Ebola outbreak. If you want to learn more about the data set, you can go to this link here, bit.ly slash Ebola data source, and you can read the actual source paper for this data set. Okay? You can also go to this DOI, just in case this link dies in five or 10 years. And we can look at a quick preview of what that data set looks like. You have the age column, you have sex, you have status. The statuses are confirmed and uh, suspected. Confirmed means they have confirmed uh, Ebola. Suspected means it's suspected. The date of onset is when the symptoms started to show for these uh, patients. The date of sample is when a test sample was taken. And the district is, of course, just the district. Now, as we're working with this data set, we're going to be showing you many different R functions for parsing and understanding your data. I want you to be keeping these questions in mind. So see when you can answer these with the code that you're learning. And whenever you feel like you can answer one of these questions, you should pause the video and try to type out the code needed to answer the question. So here are the questions. When was the first case reported? As at the end of June 2014, which age group had had the most cases? What was the median age of those affected? See when you have enough R code to answer that question. Have there been more cases in men or in women? Next, what district has had the most uh, reported cases? And finally, by the end of June 14, which is basically by the end of this data set, uh, was the outbreak growing or receding? See at which point in the lesson you feel like you can confidently answer those questions by typing up some R code. So now let's look at how to explore your data set in R. We're going to open a new section and call it uh, Explore Data. Okay, so let's make a section and call it Explore Data. And actually something I forgot to mention is that here uh, our studio chose the name Ebola Sierra Leone for us based on the name of this um, file, this CSV, but you can import it with whatever name you want. So it doesn't have to be Ebola Sierra Leone. In any case, let's go ahead and think about how to explore our data. So we're going to look at a few functions that help you get a quick sense of what your data looks like. One of those functions is called head. So you run head, okay? And then the data set you care about, in this case, Ebola Sierra Leone. All right, and let's run that. I think you have seen this function before, actually. What it does is it returns the first six rows of your data set. If you want to return uh, more than six, you can put a comma and put the next argument, which is n n equals whatever number of rows you care about, for example, 10. So you can return the first 10 rows like that. If you try to return more than 10 rows, say something like 50, RStudio will truncate your output. It will shorten your output for you. Okay, it's, it gives you only 10, and then it says 
use print and blah 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 to see more rows. So if you want to see more rows, then you have to type a print instead of head. Okay, let's type a print there. And then we can see more rows. So RStudio shortens it for you. Okay, similar to head, you have the tail. The tail returns the bottom rows of your data set. Okay, so we can type tail and then run that. And that gives us the bottom six rows. We don't really have a way of knowing that it's the bottom, but I promise you it is the bottom. Okay, uh, now we can use another function that's called an end call. What does end call stand for? The number of columns. So the number of columns of the Ebola Sierra Leone data set. Okay, we can see there's seven. How about n row, the number of rows? We can see that there are uh, 200 rows. Now these functions may seem a little bit useless in the context of this small data set, but when you have larger data sets, it's often useful to just look at a sneak peek of the data set or see some quick stats on the data set with nCall and nRow. A related function to nCall and nRow is the function dim, which stands for dimensions, so Ebola, Sierra Leone data, dim, and that gives us both the number of rows and the number of columns, okay? Then I'll show you one last quick function for exploring your data, it's called summary. So you, you call summary and then again your data set in there, and then we run a command or control enter. Let's expand the console so we can see that output a bit better. Okay, so uh, what do we see here? It looks like for the numeric columns, things like age, it gives us the minimum, the first quartile, if you don't know what that is, you can Google it, the median, the mean, the third quartile, the max, and the number of missings, the number of NAs. And then for the characters or the strings, which are just uh, pieces of text, we'll talk about what these are later, it just tells you the length, that is how many rows they are. Um, and that's about it. For the dates, it's considering the dates kind of as numerics as well. So it also shows you that same information, the minimum, the quartiles, the mean, median, and so on. Now, as a quick reminder, if you're wondering what any of these functions does, or you're looking for some additional arguments to those functions, you can just type question mark and then the name of the function, for example, question mark uh, n call. Okay, you can run that. And it'll show up in your help tab here what that function is doing. In this case, the help is both for nRow and nCall. You can scroll through, look at some examples in the bottom, and that way you can better understand what's happening uh, with the code. Still on the topic of data exploration, now I'm going to show you a very nice function, which comes from this package of vizdat. The function that I'm going to show you is actually called a vizdat. So to find that function, let's type vizdat, and then, uh, whoops, and then two colons. And then we can scroll through to find the function I'm caring about, or I'm thinking about, which is this one, the viz hyphen, or viz underscore dat. And we can put our data set in the Ebola Sierra Leone. And we can run that there. And let's see what it gives us. It gives us in this plots pane, we need to expand it a bit. What is this? It's a basically a visualization of your data. It shows you all of the columns. Imagine this is a kind of zoomed out spreadsheet. And it also shows you the types of the columns, which are characters, which are dates, which are uh, numerics. And it also shows you in those uh, light gray lines there where there are some missing values. So a nice way to just quickly zoom out and get a quick sense of what your data set looks like. The next function I'll show you for quickly exploring your data is called uh, inspect cat. And it comes from the, uh, the inspect DF package that we loaded here, inspect DF. So uh, let's, let's uh, make some space for our code. And let's go ahead and type uh, inspect cat. Okay, inspect cat, and we can see it come up. Um, in this case, we didn't type the name of the package first. Remember I told you that you could type the name of the package first, and this is a full signifier. And the reason you might do this is that it basically makes your code uh, sometimes a bit easier to read because people know exactly where that function comes from. Okay, but it's really up to you. It's a, it's a bit of a stylistic thing. Okay, in any case, uh, here we're just going to type inspect cat, and then Ebola Sierra Leone again. And when we run that, uh, the output is in our console. So let's take a look there. Uh, it doesn't look to be anything uh, quite meaningful. Um, but what we're going to do is send this output to the uh, show plot function, which also comes from inspect df. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, send this thing into show plot. We're going to nest it in show plot and run that that way. Okay. And now it'll show us a very nice plot. It says, though, that the viewport has zero dimensions because our plot window is too small. So let's open that up properly, and then let's run that code again. And what does it show us? Something very nice. It shows us basically for the categorical variables and uh, for the date variables as well, what is the breakdown of the categories? So you can see that there are more women than men, more F than M. 
you can see that they're more confirmed than the other one, which is suspected. It's too small to show the label. You can see most people come from the Kailahu district. You can see what sort of a distribution of dates you have in terms of date of onset and date of sample. So really a very nice overview of those uh, variables. Now a quick clarification about what we did here. This is what we call function nesting. I explained it in a previous lesson, but let me just quickly uh, go through it again. So what we did here essentially, I'm going to uh, cut this out and put it on the next line, okay, and close that. What we did here will be analogous or similar to first taking the output of inspect cat Ebola Sierra Leone, which was this, this table here or this tibble. Uh, you don't know yet what a tibble is, we'll explain that later on. Okay, so it's like taking this thing and assigning it to an object. Hopefully you remember how to assign an object. It is a uh, less than and then minus, but really you should use the shortcut which is option and then minus or alt minus if you are on a uh, Windows, okay? We take that and we assign it to some object. Let's say, um, let's just call it, what should we call it? Let's call it categorical summary, cat summary, okay? And what we've done there, what we do next rather, is we take this cat summary and plop it into show plot. So we're taking this table here and asking R, show us a plot of that table, or rather asking uh, inspect D, the inspect DF package. Okay, so we can run that again. Let's open up our plots. To, to close this plot, we're going to click on this, uh, this X over there. Okay, so let's go ahead and click on that. Remove the current plot indeed. Uh, so we can run it again and run show plot now on cat summary, and we get that same plot. So what we've done here is analogous to just taking this portion of code, okay, and nesting it inside of show plot. Hopefully you see how that is happening. So this, uh, this thing here, inspect cat, becomes this object, and we can ask for the plot of that object, or we can put the output directly inside of the function show plot in a uh, nesting uh, setup. But now that I've explained that, let's neaten up our script so that our script is really only doing one thing, and get rid of this. And in fact, uh, to be even neater, I'm going to get rid of that package name because I don't think it's necessary in this case. And another thing we should get rid of is this question mark and call because that's not relevant to our analysis. Okay, it was just a side quest. And uh, this, this function, or rather this plot that I've shown you, is quite nice, but we could uh, make it better. We could, we could improve it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to make it interactive by using another function which comes from the uh, Plotly package. Now we're learning a lot of functions here, don't get overwhelmed, okay? The idea is just to introduce you to a, a wide breadth of different things you can do uh, for your uh, exploratory data analysis, but you can always come back to this uh, script later if you've forgotten a specific function. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, take the output of this stuff and put it inside of ggplotly, okay? So we could either do another nesting. If we're gonna do another nesting, then we should probably press enter inside of ggplotly and put that code there, all right? And we can run it that way. But now it's starting to look a little bit uh, scary. So instead of nesting it that way, this is correct, but instead of doing that, I'm going to assign an intermediate object indeed. So I'm going to call this thing, whoops, I'm going to call this uh, the plot, the cat summary plot, so let's call that cat summary plot. And we're going to pass that object into ggplotly, okay? And what ggplotly will do is make a nice uh, interactive uh, diagram for us, okay? So We've lost the labels, but actually you can hover over this interactive diagram and look at each of the labels. So now we can see, for example, that the proportion of people who count as confirmed, let me zoom in, the proportion who count as confirmed is 0.9 or 90%, okay? And the proportion who count as uh, suspected, it says new level key suspected there, that proportion is 0.09 or uh, 9%, so you have to multiply it by 100 to get to the percentage. Now we should actually add a few more comments to make sure that it's clear what our code is doing. So I'm going to put a small comment here that says um, categorical, whoops, no, visdat is for a general overview of data, okay? And then the categorical stuff we did here with inspect cat, we can call that a categorical overview. The next thing we're going to look at is the numerical overview. If you want to look at the overview of the numerical uh, columns in your data set, you're going to use uh, the following function. It's called inspect num. So instead of inspect cat here, we're going to use inspect num. And in fact, I'm just going to copy that whole line of code and paste it, all right? And uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's type in inspect num, okay? And here changes to num summary plot. So I run that line of code. 
And to view the num summary plot, we can just uh, highlight it and then press Command Enter or Control Enter, and that'll send this to the console. Okay, and now we can see uh, histograms of the two numeric variables in our data set. The age variable there, you can see that most people cluster around age 40. Okay, and the ID variable, but the ID is just IDs that don't really mean anything, so that's a bit uh, useless in that case. But again, you can see we have a nice numerical overview of all of our uh, of all the numerical variables. So again, we're going to do ggplotly on this output. Okay, so ggplotly on num summary plot, and it'll make that diagram uh, interactive. So you can hover over and see, for example, that those with a middle of 27.5, let me zoom in a bit, those with a middle of 27.5, that is those from 25 to 30, that's how you read a histogram. If you want, you can uh, do a quick Google to see how to read histograms. But those from 25 to 30 make up 0.13 of the whole uh, population, of the whole sample. 0.133 is a 13%. Don't get too overwhelmed. I'm just trying to uh, make sure you understand what we're looking at. But it's not super relevant for our lesson. We just want you to know that you have these nice functions that can give you a quick overview of your data sets. So now that you see how to get an overview of multiple variables at a time in your data sets, we're going to look at what happens when you want to zoom in on specific variables, on specific uh, columns. So to do that, I'm going to make a new section. And instead of explore data, we're going to call it um, analyzing individual variables or analyzing single variables, whoops, single variables. And we're going to start with numeric variables, okay? So numeric addition or something like that. So in order to analyze a single variable, you need to have some way of pulling it out of your data set. The easiest and most basic way to do that in R is with what's called the dollar sign operator. So we're going to grab our data set, which remember is Ebola Sierra Leone, and we're going to try to pull out the age variable. So we're going to type Ebola Sierra Leone hyphen, sorry, not hyphen, but rather dollar sign. And then our studio gives us the nice selection menu there. We can click on age, or if you want, you can type it manually. So we click on age and we run that code. And as we can see here, we have, what is this? This is basically all of the ages that we had in our data set. It's a very long uh, list. Specifically, what this thing we've just printed out is, is it's called a vector, a vector in R. We're going to introduce you to vectors properly later, but just think of a vector as a list of things that are all of the same type. A vector is a, li a, vector is a list of things that are all of the same type. Now we can ask some basic questions of this vector. For example, we can ask, what is the mean age? All right, so we can type the following function, mean, all right, and then put this stuff in there, Ebola here in hyphen, I keep saying hyphen when I mean dollar sign, Ebola here in dollar sign H, okay? So we run that code and whoops, it looks like we have a problem. It says NA, NA means not applicable or not available. Why is it NA? Well, here's the problem. If you look at this vector uh, of ages, you see there are a few NAs in there. We have one NA there, we have some others uh, throughout the data set. That means that the uh, value is missing and R cannot find the mean of a bunch of values where some of them are missing. You need to get rid of the missing ones for R to understand that code. So to do that, you're going to put a comma and there's a function in mean called na.rm. To see that function, I think you can press tab. Yes, if you press tab, you see the other functions in R, sorry, in the mean function. And here we have na.rm. Okay, a logical evaluating to true or false, indicating whether any value should be stripped. So we can click on this thing, okay, and set that logical to true. Okay, we haven't properly looked at logicals yet, but just know that there are two special types of values in R, true, all in capital case, and false, all in capital case, and they're, they're quite unique, they're quite important. Okay, so we set na.rm equals true, and we can run that code now. And what that has done is ignored the NAs, and we have our nice new uh, mean, which is 33.8. Now, instead of na.rm equals true, you could also shorten it and write na.rm equals t. So an R, T stands for true, and F stands for false, okay? And another thing you might ask is, is R so stupid? Why doesn't it just remove the NAs by default? Why does it force you to have to type this extra piece of code? The reason it does that is because it wants you to know that there are NAs in your data set. Because there are NAs in our data set, this our mean is not fully valid. Imagine if 90% uh, of the data set was missing. 90% of the data was just NAs, and you found the mean, and the mean was say something like 60, and you said, the mean of my sample is 60. 
that would be a wrong statement. It, would, it really should be the mean of 10% of my sample is, is 60. But because you didn't check your data set, you didn't know that, and therefore you made a false statement. So R forces you to reckon with the missingness in your data set. This applies to other functions too. So now we're going to look at other functions you can use to analyze your numeric variable. We can try something like median. So we want to find the median of Ebola Sierra Leone age. Okay, we run that there. It tells us NA until we put NA.RM equals true. So I copy that from the previous line, I paste it in, and we run that, and now we have the uh, median. So these are just two functions. Let's look at a number of additional ones. But before we do that, we can shorten this code a little bit, make it a bit easier to read by assigning this stuff here, Ebola Sierra Leone uh, age, into its own object. We'll call that object something like a age underscore vec. Okay, and that'll make the rest of the code slightly uh, more legible. Let's press a bunch of enters so we can pull this to the middle of our data set, or rather to the middle of our screen. So now we're going to try a few other functions. We start with the SD function. What does it do? It gives you the standard deviation. So SD, you put in the age vec there, okay, comma, na.rm equals true in this case. And that is our standard deviation there. We can look at the minimum age, so min, and then age vec na.rm equals true. I'm actually just going to uh, copy that and then type min instead, okay? We can see that the minimum age is 1.8. Okay, we can look at the maximum age, max, or we can look at a single summary that gives us many of these statistics. So we could type a summary of age vec, summary, all right? And I think for summary, we don't actually need the na.rm equals true. Let's check that by deleting this and pressing tab. And we can see there isn't actually an argument called na.rm equals true here. So I don't think that's relevant because summary takes into account the NAs, okay? And you don't have to actually uh, get rid of them. So we can uh, run summary without the NA.RM equals true, and it's all the same code there. We can check the length of the vectors with the function length, or the length of the, the vector singular. Okay, length, okay, it is 200 because of course it came from a table that had 200 rows. And something else you could do is you could find the sum of the ages. I don't know why you would care about the sum, but maybe you do, maybe in another context. In this case, we do need na.rm equals true, okay? And we can see that the sum of the ages equals 6,000 years. Now I know that we're teaching you many functions again, and you're starting to get scared about, am I going to have to learn these functions? Well, not really. First of all, many of them are kind of natural sounding. Min, min is minimum, max is maximum. So that's kind of easy. And also, you can just always Google. Just Google, what is the function for median in R? And the first one or two uh, results should be correct. All you need to remember is that there is some function for it and what the syntax for that function might look like. Okay, so now we're done with the section on analyzing a single variable numeric. We're going to look at how about when you want to visualize a single numeric variable. So visualizing a single num uh, variable's numeric. For plotting with R, there are generally two main families of visualizations. There are visualizations that are created with what's called base R or base plotting. These are plotting functions that come built into R, and they are visualizations that come with a package called ggplot. What is ggplot? First of all, it's a very funny name, but secondly, it's one of the packages that comes within this tidyverse meta package that we talked about. The tidyverse meta package is really a very wonderful thing, and we are thankful to the team that builds that. In general, ggplot graphics are preferred. So first, I'll just show you the base plot way to visualize a single variable. One base plot function you could use is something called hist, which stands for histogram. We could pass the age vec, which again is this long list of ages, into hist, and it won't show us the plot because our figure margins are too large for that space. So we rerun that now that we have more space. It gives us a histogram of age vec, just like you saw before. There's also a function called box plot, box plot age vec, okay? But like I mentioned, ggplot visualizations are generally more recommended. So you can really just forget about these for the most part. We're going to look at how to use uh, ggplot instead. So let me just put a small comment and write ggplot. Actually, when I say we're going to use ggplot, I'm not being fully honest. What we're going to use is a package called esquis. esquis. And what esquis does is it gives us a point-and-click interface that lets us easily create uh, ggplot figures. The code for ggplot can take a little while to get used to, so we actually will introduce you to that in a separate course. 
For now, we're just going to show you how to use this Esquiz graphic user interface, which is a very nice way to get started. It is quite limited in its functionality, but it's a nice way to get started and acquainted with the idea of making a ggplots. In order to use Esquiz, we can type the package name. I've already typed it, so I'm just going to copy paste, and then our two colons, and the key function here is Esquizer. So I can scroll through and look for Esquizer there, all right? Now that I found it, I don't actually need the name of the package there. I don't need the full signifier. I can just put our function. And inside of this, we can put that vector we've been playing with, that list of ages. So I can plop that in there. All right, run that. And uh, Esquisse is going to be hard to use so zoomed in like this. So I might have to zoom out. But let's see. I'm going to drag the data column or the data variable. You can see it's labeled there as variables into my x-axis. So let's drag data into x-axis and let's see what it does. Like I imagined, it's a bit too small to see, so let me try and zoom out a bit. And as you can see, it's the same kind of uh, plot of the ages, but it already looks a little bit uh, more elegant. In fact, though, in general, when we're using Esquisse, we don't pass individual vectors into the data the way I've done here. We actually will pass the whole data set in. So we're going to, let me zoom back in, we're going to pass, instead of HVEC, let's pass in the whole Ebola Sierra Leone data set. And that'll make everything we're doing a little bit clearer. So now I zoom back out again because I'm about to jump into a skis. All right. So what we can see here are each of the variables in this uh, Ebola data set. I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit. Let's see how that works. Okay. So we have each of the variables in the data set. And the one we were working with is called age. So we can drag age to the X axis of our data set. And we can uh, moreover click on histogram here and change it to some other plot styles. Instead of histogram, we could try it as a density plot, which smooths it out. And we can change the smoothing settings. I'll show you how to do that maybe later. Actually, I'm not sure if I will. <laughs> we can change it to a box plot. And we can see what the box plot looks like there. We can change it to a violin plot. A violin plot is similar to a box plot, but it's uh, more rounded. And my goal here was to show you how to visualize a single variable but since we're already here, it's a bit too tempting to show you how to visualize multiple variables. So let's go ahead and try that. So now we're going to try to uh, visualize the age distribution across different sexes. To do that, all we have to do is drag the sex variable onto the y-axis. And what that gives us is two different box plots, one for men at the uh, top and another one for women at the bottom. If we want, we can change it back to the violin plot. It gives us the box plot by default. Let's change it back to the violin so we can see what those look like. Another thing you could do is change the colors of these, uh, these violin plots. So you could drag the sex variable or the sex column into this box that says fill. And that gives us two different colors of plots. And I think it also gives us, if we zoom out a little bit, it also gives us a nice legend here with the uh, male and female categories. But like I said, the goal here isn't to jump fully into all the kinds of visualizations you can do with Esquiz. I invite you, though, to go ahead and play around with this uh, graphic user interface. It's quite simple to use. In particular, try playing with these uh, buttons at the bottom. Try adding labels. Try adding a title. You can say this is my first plot, for example. And you can see that it gives you, if we close this now, click on that, I guess, uh, it gives you a nice uh, title. Try playing with the subtitles, the captions. Try messing with the plot options. For example, you can mess with the bandwidth here, okay? But most importantly, you should go to that last tab there, code, and look at the code that was used to generate this plot. Why is that useful? We're actually going to copy that code into our script. That way, whenever we want to regenerate the plot, we can just run the same code. Again, coming back to the concept of reproducibility. So we're going to copy this to clipboard. And before we close Esquisse, actually, I realized I should quickly mention what a violin plot is because it's not super intuitive to everyone. On our x-axis, you can see that there's a bunch of ages. You might not see it very well on my recording, but on your screen, you should see it uh, quite nicely, okay? And basically, wherever the violin is fat is wherever you have lots of people. So here, the violin is fat around 40, okay? So there's lots of people around 40. The violin is quite skinny above 60, so very few people at age 60. So, so it gives you a nice hourglass way of representing uh, the distribution of those variables. But for now, we can copy that code. I guess I already did that. And close Esquisse. We can paste that code into our script. So let's paste it. 
Now, as you can see, the code here is ggplot code. So like I mentioned, we have used a skis to create a ggplot plot and we use the graphic user interface, but eventually you're going to have to learn how to at least understand ggplot code. You usually don't have to memorize every single function because these things are easily Googleable, or you can just consult the help files. But eventually, in order to make more complex plots and more attractive plots, you will need to learn how to write ggplot code. But that is for another course. For now, we can uh, put a hash symbol before this esquisser because it's not part of our reproducible analysis. The reproducible thing is this ggplot code. So now we are done with uh, this section on visualizing single variables numeric. Although now I'm realizing we're actually not visualizing a single variable here. So in order to stay uh, faithful to the actual title of this section, let's make a new plot that is actually just the, um, a single variable. So let's pull the age into the x axis. And we're just going to copy the code for this histogram. Copy that to clipboard. Okay. And we paste that in. And this code, if you want, you can keep it in your script. I'll comment it out for now. And let's just put in the histogram code. So now we have the code for generating that histogram, which allows us to visualize a single uh, numeric variable. So now let's jump to the next section of the lesson, which is analyzing uh, categorical variables. So analyzing single variables uh, categorical. Now I'm assuming you know what a categorical variable is. It's something with distinct categories, something like male versus female, or Africa, Europe, North America. So distinct categories as opposed to something like uh, age, which is a continuous variable because you can be zero years, you can be 0 0.111 years, you can be 0 0.1112 years, and so on and so forth. So the categorical variable in our data set that we're going to be thinking about is the uh, district variable. So again, we're going to use that dollar sign syntax to pull out our variable. So we type Ebola, we get the nice autocomplete, we press enter, then the dollar sign, and we're going to pull out the district variable. We can run that code, and let's look at our console so we can see what actually got printed. As you can see, it's a nice long vector of all of the uh, district names in our data set. It should be about 200 um, elements long. You can see this is 199, so that means that one is 200. And so the most common way to analyze a single categorical variable is to make a table of it to look at its numbers. So to do that, R has a nice built-in function called a table, of course. <laughs> so we do table, and we can put in that vector there. All right, we run that code, and what we have there is a not so nicely formatted, but somewhat useful table, giving us the counts of rows per district. So there's two people from Bo, there's 155 people from Kailahu, and so on. So the table function is quite nice, but as with many things, there's a nicer function that someone else has built in an external R package, and that is the function called uh, also table, but I'll show you how it's spelled. It comes from the janitor package. So we're going to look into the janitor package and pull out a function called table. So I put uh, two colons there, and I, let's look for table. Actually, I know how to spell it, so I don't actually need that. It's like this, okay? So table, T-A-B-Y-L, if you want, you can call it table, or you could just call it janitor table. That's usually how you would hear code. So janitor table is a nicer form of table. Let's see what it looks like. Let's paste that code in and run that. So as you can see, the output from a janitor table is a bit nicer. First of all, it's formatted uh, more nicely. You, it's easier to read, okay? Secondly, you also have a percent column there, which gives you the uh, percentages of the different uh, variables. I think technically there is a bit of a mistake because that isn't a percent, that is a proportion. So 0 0.775 is actually 77.5%. Despite that bad uh, nomenclature there, the janitor table function is otherwise uh, quite good. There is one small side note though. Generally when you use the janitor table function, this isn't the exact syntax you want to use. Um, in order to make that clear, I'm going to consult the help file for the janitor table function. Let's get some practice looking at help files. So I look at the help file for janitor table, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit, okay? As we can see, it says that the way to call the janitor table function is type table, then dat, whatever your data set is, and then the names of the variables that you care about. We'll, we'll see that in a bit more, uh, in a bit of a clearer sense by looking at some examples. So here we have some examples. 
And actually we can run those examples directly by clicking on that button there, run examples. What does that do? It gives us this nice documentation where you can look at all of the examples having been run. So here it shows the example on this empty cars data set, table empty cars comma CYL. So what that seems to be showing us is that the way to actually call the janitor table function, if we follow the help file, is to first put the data set just like they have there with empty cars, okay, then a comma, and then the variable of concern, so district. So this is the proper way to call the janitor table function. It gives us a nicer output than the other one, because in the other case we have this Ebola Sierra Leone, a dollar sign district, but here we just have district, which is a bit easier to read. But the other beautiful thing about that is that it gives us a nice way to do what are called cross tables or cross tabulations. Like you see here, table, empty cars, sale, and gear. Let's look at it in the context of our data set. It'll become clear. So table, Ebola, Sierra Leone, district, and six. Let's run that, and it should be easy to understand the output. So this is a count of uh, the population or the sample by both sex and district. So we have zero... Uh, women from Bo, let me zoom in there, zero women from Bo, uh, two men from Bo, right? 91 women, F stand for women, 91 women from Kailahu, uh, 64 men from Kailahu, and so on and so forth. So a nice way to do a, a two-way tabulation. Now let's look at how to visualize a categorical variable. So we make a new section, and we call it uh, visualizing, visualizing single variables categorical. Now we get back to the question of ggplot versus base. We're going to focus on ggplot, but I'll quickly show you a way to plot this in base R. So you could grab this vector again and then put it inside of the table function. So what we're going to do is create a visualization of this table output by passing that into bar plot or nesting it in bar plot. So if you run that, then you can see a plot of the uh, table, <laughs> but you can't see it until you uh, expand your plot view window. So you can see the bar plot that shows the distribution of uh, respondents or rather patients across the different uh, districts. But again, we don't recommend using base plotting. We recommend ggplot, but in your case, esquisse. So we're going to pull up a esquisse or rather the esquisser function from esquisse and then put Ebola Sierra Leone in there. Okay, before I run that, I will need to zoom out so that I can actually see the esquisse output. And again, what we would like to visualize is the distribution of the sample across districts. So we can drag the district variable or the district column into this X box here for the X axis. And as you can see, it gives us a nice bar chart as we might expect. If you want, you can go ahead and try playing with some of these other variables. For example, if you try dragging the district into the fill section, you'll get each of the bars filled according to the district. Or you could drag it into color and see what that looks like. There you have the outline of them is colored according to district. I encourage you to go wild with your explorations in Esquisse. Every now and then though, you should come and look at the code that is being generated here so that you can start to get an intuition for what ggplot code looks like because very soon you're going to have to write this code on your own. So for now we can copy this to clipboard and put it in our script. And this is an example of what we were trying to do here, which is uh, visualizing single categorical variables. We can comment out the Esquisser there. And all we want is this piece of code this fully reproducible piece of code that creates our nice plot there. As we can see, it's not so, so nice because there is a, uh, an overlap there. I invite you to play with Esquisse sufficiently to figure out how to get rid of that overlap. So now we're basically done covering all of the topics we set out to cover. So let's see if we can jump back to those questions I had asked you to keep in mind at the beginning of the lesson. So I'm going to copy them and paste them in here, okay? And let's see how to answer those. Hopefully you have tried to answer them. If you haven't, try and pause the video now and see which of these you can answer on your own. So the first one says, when was the first case reported? Well, technically we don't have a date of report in this data set, but we can use maybe the date of sample as a proxy for that. The date of sample is when the test sample was taken. taken. We can assume that's when it was reported. So uh, let's try that. We'll do the min, the min of the date of sample a variable or the date of sample column. So mini bullets here alone, dollar sign and then date of sample. And we can see that the minimum there is a May uh, 23rd of 2014. So that's when the first case was reported or rather the first date of sample. How about the median age of those affected? This is quite simple. We actually did it in the in the course of the lesson. So it will be the median function, okay? And then in bullets here alone, dollar sign age 
But of course, that won't work. You need the na.rm. So na.rm equals t or true. Okay. And now we can see the median age is 35. Had there been more cases in men or women, how could we answer this? Actually, we already answered it. You do table, either the regular table or janitor table. In this case, I'm using janitor table. Um, Ebola, Sierra Leone, and then um, the sex column, right? We run that, and we can see the percentages there. If you want, you can instead create maybe a bar chart. Let's do that very quickly. We do Esquiser, Ebola, Sierra Leone, okay? And, uh, and it's going to be too hard to use that at that zoom level, so let's zoom out and quickly drag the sex column onto the x-axis. If you want it to be colorful, you could also drag it onto the fill. So now we have the men and women, and we can clearly see that there are more women. We can copy that code there, copy it to clipboard, close that, zoom back in, and now we have a nice way to answer that question with both a table and a plot, and we can run that just to make sure that it works. That's wonderful. Which, which district has had the most reported cases? This is beautiful because what we can do actually is just copy this code and it's the same question but for districts. So instead of sex we can just replace this with districts okay and run that okay and we can see that the Kailanghu district of course has had the most cases but we've already kind of seen this before. Similarly here we can replace the x equals sex with x equals district, fill equals sex with fill equals district. We run that and we have our nice plot there of the distribution by districts. And the last question, by the end of 2014, was the outbreak growing or receding? How do we answer that? Well, we want to create some kind of um, diagram showing the number of cases in each day. Do you have an idea of how to do that? We can actually do that with uh, the esquisse. So let's, let's open up Esquiser again and open up Ebola Sierra Leone. Let me zoom out, Sorry. okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to drag the date of onset, that's when the person got sick, into the x-axis. And that will give us a sense of how many people were getting sick in each, uh, on each day. Okay, so we can copy that code. All right, copy it to clipboard. And we can paste that code in here. All right, and let's run that and see what the output is. So it's asking us by the end of June, which is kind of towards the end of that, uh, that bar chart, is the outbreak growing or receding? I would say it's not that clear, actually. You might say it's growing, but I think you would need a sort of longer trend line to be sure what's happening at the end. So, so I would say unclear. That's actually my answer. Okay, so it's a bit of a trick question for you. Um, although you might say it, it is growing. It's, it's, not, it's not super clear. All right, so, all right, so we're basically done with the lesson. However, if you feel like you haven't had enough, I'm going to give you another data set which you can import and try this whole process again. So if you're feeling like you want to get some additional practice, you can try this with this new data set I'm going to paste in here. Or of course you can try this whole process with your own data set. You import it, you visualize it, you get a sense of what the distribution of key variables are, and see what sorts of questions you can answer about that data set using these functions that we've learned about. But I've pasted in this link here of the uh, Yaoundé COVID data set, bit.ly slash view Yaoundé COVID data. If you go to that link, you can download a different data set. This will actually be an Excel spreadsheet. So when, you, when you're trying to upload it, or uh, import it rather, you should go to import data set and then from Excel, as opposed to from text, okay? And if you want to learn more about that data set, you can go to this link here, go.nature.com. This is a data set you're going to run into uh, later on in our courses. It's covered in quite great detail in the uh, Wrangling course. Now, the very last thing I want to talk about is uh, why not Excel? Why not Excel? I was teaching this lesson a while back to a student, and, uh, and he asked me, uh, why don't we use Excel for this stuff? It seems so uh, basic. And I really didn't have a good answer for him, because it really is the case that for these small data sets we're using in this intro session, uh, the benefits of R are not super obvious. Because we're using small data, and Excel works pretty well with small data. And also the workflow is pretty simple. The plots are pretty simple. So for now, there's no good answer because we haven't reached the level of complexity and really the level of beauty that you're going to come to experience uh, working with R eventually. So for now, you're just going to have to trust me that the kind of analytic power you're going to get by working within the R ecosystem will be orders of magnitude greater than what you can get working with a graphic user interface uh, like Microsoft Excel or, or Google Sheets. 
Okay, so we're mostly done with the lesson. Let's quickly do an overview of our learning objectives and see if these were achieved. First, we were hoping that you'd be able to use RStudio's graphic user interface to import CSV data into R. Hopefully you remember how to do that, file import from text and so on. Next, I wanted you to be able to explain the concept of reproducibility. Hopefully you can explain that. Next, I wanted you to be able to use a number of functions to get some summaries of your data. N row and call dim to get the dimensions, for example, and the summary function to get an overall summary of the data set. Then we wanted you to be able to use a range of functions to get visual summaries of your data set. Things like visdat, inspectnum, and inspectcat. Hopefully you remember those in combination with a show plot. Then I wanted you to know how to extract and inspect a numeric variable with functions like mean, median, max, min, length, and sum. And hopefully you remember the na.rm part of that. And also with basic esquisse generated uh, ggplot graphics. And I wanted you to be able to do the same thing for categorical variables with functions like table and the table from janitor. And again, with esquisse generated ggplot graphics. Hopefully you're feeling confident in all of these. If not, that's an indication maybe that you can rewatch some portions of the video. Well, congratulations. You have now taken your first baby steps in data analysis with R. Of course, we've only given you a sneak peek of the data analysis workflow. Soon we're going to go on to more complex things, but I hope you're feeling already excited by the sneak peek, and I hope you're feeling confident enough to take some of the things we've learned and apply them to your own data sets. I'm excited to keep showing you the wonderful world of R for data analysis. So I'll see you in the next lesson. Bye bye. For more resources, visit our website where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes, and lesson notes and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today.